All right. So the problem with blockchains is that it's, uh, they're a bit like a religion. You, you see the light, you get converted, and then you feel this, this inherent urge to try and convert other people. Uh, and and that's, that's hard. It's not like you can sort of say, love, God is love, and follow the neighbor and stuff. You've got quite a complex topic to, to explain. And if you're a slightly socially awkward ex-programmer, you, what happens is you don't get invited back to any more dinner parties. <laughs> And I've certainly witnessed firsthand trying to explain the difference between proof of work and proof of stake to somebody and seeing their, their face sort of glaze over and then to collapse into their dessert. So uh, over the years, I've honed my techniques uh, a little bit and uh, to the point where my social life is sort of plateaued. And uh, what I'm going to do is to share some of the, the ways, some of the techniques I've used to explain this to people who don't know anything about this. These are people who kind of use computers, they've used a spreadsheet, they, th they may have heard of Bitcoin as this thing that you can use to buy drugs, uh, but not much else. And uh, before I go on, I'm to all the ex and this, doing this sort of presentation in, in the presence of some of the best minds in the world is, is somewhat daunting uh, in this space. So I'm going to unashamedly vastly simplify things and, and, and in order to bring it down into a very short presentation. So, uh, and so... Two bits of advice before you start at your dinner party. Uh, you need to keep it short, so don't, you know, 10 minutes is fine. I'm going to try and keep mine to about 10 minutes. Uh, and don't bring a projector and slides. Uh, <laughs> there's no room on the table and people think you're weird, so don't do that. So, uh, there's really three parts to the story. Uh, first one is, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Second thing is, how does it work? And the third is, why is it so important? So, first thing, what is the blockchain, what's the problem that we're trying to solve here? Let's imagine I have a, an apple, a real physical apple, and I, you're my neighbour, I, kind of, I kind of don't trust you that much, you've got tattoos and you come home late, I don't really quite know you well enough, but I want to transact with you, I want to give you my apple, so I hand it to you. Uh, I touched it, you touched it, it we transferred some value, and, and that's, we didn't need any, anybody else in that transaction. So let's imagine I want to give you a digital apple. So, hmm, how might I do that? I might take a picture of that apple. I might attach it to an email, and I might email it through to you, send you, send you it as a JPEG. So how do we know who owns that digital apple now? Because uh, I might have sent it to 10 of my closest friends before I sent it to you. So I might have kept a copy, a copy for myself. So you've got a copy, I've got a copy. How do we know who is the true owner of that apple? So this is known as the double spending problem, and it is something that has been uh, taxing some of the best computer science minds for decades. How do you solve that fundamental problem of, transfer of, of ownership of digital assets? Uh, and they wrestled for a long time, and they really couldn't, couldn't solve it. So the workaround to this problem uh, is to use a trusted third party. So Harold lives up the road. Salt of the earth sort of guy, old, old fella, I trust him, my neighbour trusts him, so we're going to ask Harold to uh, keep a record of uh, who owns which digital apple in, in my neighbourhood. So we're going to trust Harold, he's going to keep it on a spreadsheet or a bit of paper, we don't care. Uh, and we're probably going to hope that Harold does keep a good copy. He locks his house at night so nobody comes and steals, steals his, his list and he's not going to come back drunk or go senile or anything else that might go wrong. So we're going to hope that none of those bad things happen and we're going to trust Harold to look after our, our, our records or our digital assets. So this mechanism is essentially how our entire global commerce system has been created over the last few decades. That fundamental concept... We don't trust each other, so we need a trusted third party to transact on our behalf. So, eight years ago, something interesting happened. A, a, a guy with a rid ridiculous pseudonym, which I'm not even going to say, because I reckon it was a practical joke. I'm going to call him John. Uh, John solved the double spending problem. Uh, so John released a white paper and some source code. So he not only proved it in theory, but he proved it in practice, because he actually created uh, he released some, some code and released something in, into the wild. And it was open source. Uh, and he called it Bitcoin, as a, and it was a way of uh, essentially uh, di digital cash, a way of transferring value, value in a digital way. So, so that was the problem that he solved. And uh, John disappeared, but that's really not, not important because it's open source and it was out there. But he fundamentally solved the problem of transferring assets between people uh, in the digital world without a trusted third party. So the second part of the story is, is really uh, how, how do you do it? Uh, how you know 
all these smart people before him had sort of not managed to do this. So I think the important thing is that most people actually don't need to know the plumbing, just like you don't know how email probably works, it just sort of works. But essentially there are, and when we talk about blockchain, we're talking about a bunch of technologies that John brought together in, in a very clever way. And all these, te all, all these technologies existed before. He assembled them, including some very clever cryptography, some gamification, uh, and, and brought them together in, in a very clever way that nobody had thought of before and created this, this Bitcoin, which is the first, first real blockchain out there. Uh, but there are some important points that you and I should really understand about how he did it in order so that we can, we can trust it. Because what we're saying here is instead of trusting Harold or our bank or Uber or anybody, we are asking you to trust the system, the protocol, the blockchain protocol. So there are some, some bits that are worth understanding. Really, the first thing is that it's peer-to-peer, -peer, decentralized system. So that's uh, a bit like BitTorrent a few years ago, so the file sharing network. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer network where anybody can install a bit of software on their laptop. Anybody can become a part of that network. You just download the software and run it. And that peer communicates with other peers on the network uh, using a certain set of predefined rules. So the peer-to-peer -peer system, decentralized way of doing things. But at the heart of the blockchain peer-to-peer -peer system uh, is essentially a ledger, a database, a bit like Harold's list that he was keeping to keep track of our, our apples. But in the blockchain world, the peer, in a peer-to-peer -peer context, that, that spreadsheet that Harold's you know, updating, it's actually replicated onto every peer on the network. So everybody gets a copy. And there's some very clever stuff that means that each of those copies are all synchronized. They're all uh, saying the same thing. So every new bit of information gets pushed into one. It gets replicated out across the whole, the whole network. So uh, this makes it incredibly robust and incredibly tamper-proof. So if you can imagine, because there's, in, in, case in the Bitcoin world, I'm sure people know this number better than I do, but 20 or 30,000 peers on the network, each with a copy of, of the database, uh, and anybody can join it, anybody can have that copy, you'd really essentially need to take down the whole internet if you're going to try and sort of get rid of that, that database. So it's very robust uh, and very tamper-proof. If I want to try and hack into it, I've got to break into at least 51% of those, those databases around the world, and I've got to hack them in all at the same time and, and, and change stuff. So very, very difficult to, to break into. So the second part that is really important to understand is that it's, it's open source. So uh, the, it's transparent. Everybody sees the rules behind blockchain, uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of the other blockchains. Uh, well, that most of the other blockchains that are out that you would have heard of. They're open source, they're transparent. The people releasing uh, the software, the people like Vitalik and his team and, and various teams around the world, if they release something that people don't like, that the community, the peers don't like, they don't install it and it doesn't happen. So they've got to convince people to, to release it and it's, it's a good thing. So they don't have, have that control. So, uh, so it's not controlled or driven by some uh, central profit or, or vote-driven entity in the middle uh, making the decisions. It's, it's di what happens is it's dictated by the, by the community and there's no restrictions on who can join that community. So if I give you a Bitcoin, I'm not giving you anything. I'm just, uh, we're both agreeing to update this database that we both trust, can't be corrupted or hacked into. And, and that's all we're doing. And because there's, uh, in the Bitcoin world, they have introduced scarcity into the maths, and that's all transparent. We can see exactly how that uh, scarcity is, is implemented. Uh, if enough people want it, it drives value up. And those of you who have owned Bitcoin, you'll be f f fairly happy at the moment. So it's, it's pretty high value against the US dollar. Uh, so Ethereum is another blockchain that came along much later, uh, it really just sort of woke up sort of a year, 18 months ago, and it was very much designed as a, as a platform, as I mentioned before, a platform for building other things onto. So very, very flexible. Bitcoin by design was quite narrow in scope, it was the first one, and it was just a, it was really just a currency, whereas Ethereum is more of a platform for building anything. So it has a, a programming language, and we can agree complex business rules, a bet, a mortgage, a will, anything like that. So really with, the, with Ethereum, it starts to look like more like a, a global operating system, a global computer where people are incentivized to either donate CPU time or, or use, use CPU time. So there's this, this massive global computer that's, that's waking up. So finally, what's, why is it so important? So as I mentioned before, our entire global system has been kind of built around this, this sort of 
other model where we need a trusted third party to do stuff for us. Uh, and uh, globalization and the internet have really taken us quite quickly into this, into this borderless global village. And the problem is that this, uh, the, 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 the profit-driven or vote-driven entities that control things have become too powerful. Facebook, Google, the US government, do we really trust them to do the right thing for us, the planet, our grandchildren? So blockchain is important because it gives us a tool to potentially change this. Thank you. Thank you.